I love everybody. Everybody. We're going to start this again. Sounds um, good. And welcome. Um, I'm here with uh, Matt Baker, who's a wonderful jazz pianist who uh, is now part of the New York jazz scene. And uh, he hails from Australia. And uh, how long, um, Matt, have you been here? Well, today is actually my 10 year anniversary. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, is that fortuitous? Is that, that is. synchronous work? <laughs> exactly. So uh, we're here to, you know, to uh, have a conversation with Matt and find a little bit more about him. And uh, so what, what drew you to the States? Well, I came here for the jazz. I've been, you know, um, New York City is the jazz capital of the world. And before I moved here, I had been here five times um, to check out the jazz and take lessons with people and immerse myself in the, in the music scene. So when it came time to wanting to leave Australia, it was pretty much a no brainer that New York was the place to come. Okay, and I think I recall you telling us a story about uh, one of the, the jazz greats that you worked with. Um, and I think you were at his, one of his concerts. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us that? I found that quite an amusing little story. So, was that, do you know which one I'm talking about? I'm not sure, but are you referring to Oscar Peterson? Well, that was one of the guys that you were interested in, but there was somebody else that I think you were sitting on the edge of the stage eating something and- Oh yeah. Uh, he yeah. That was Herbie Hancock. And I was, I saw Herbie Hancock play the Blue Note and I was eating a bowl of fries and sitting at the table right next to the piano. And I was trying to get the ketchup out of the bottle and I was shaking it <laughs> and it wouldn't come out. And he, he was talking to the audience and he saw me and he said, hey, can I give you some help, kid? And so he grabbed the bottle and went on the back of it like that and it all came out. And he, so Herbie taught me how to get ketchup out of a bottle. <laughs> That's great. And the other one that uh, you were very influenced by was Oscar Peterson. In fact, um, you did a tribute show to him. And so, you know, he obviously was a jazz icon. And, um, but what particularly uh, were the things that you um, got from his playing that influenced your playing? Well, before seeing him live, it was his, his technique and um, touch um, and ideas that really influenced me, that, that really sort of soaked in through the skin. But when I saw him live, the thing that I got that I could only get live was his energy. The energy that came off the stage when they played was just electrifying. And that's something that I picked up and I think has absorbed into my playing as well. Fantastic. I, I really wish, you know, that's one of my fervent wishes that young people really start going to live things because you talk about that energy that that's palpable in a live setting that you can't get on a computer or even a recording. Yeah. So I hope that, you know, that you can, you know, get people to come for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. What, you know, now that you we're talking about some of your early influences, what, what were your early influences? What drew you to the piano as opposed to, you know, another instrument? Well, both my parents um, are musicians. And so my father particularly is a, is a jazz musician. And so he was, I would say, an early influence because he would play jazz. We'd go out to see him play and he would play music around the house and hear him play that. So that was definitely an influence. My parents just started me on the piano as any good parent would do to their kids. Um, and granted, they both played piano as well. So I started piano lessons um, for that reason. Um, but then I, I started to see how I could improvise and jazz things up on the piano and after I after a few years I was starting to jazz up in the classical pieces and listen to pop music and transcribe pop music and um, so 
that's what sort of started to get me interested in jazz besides the influence that was already coming from the home life. And it was when I was 12 and I was on my third grade of classical piano that my teacher um, unselfishly said to me, you know, Matt, it might be good if you change to jazz piano lessons. And so that's what started the jazz direction. But you, you did have a classical training, correct? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I think that Seven. that's really critical. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what, are, what are some of the um, classical composers that um, influenced you the most? Well, the classical composers that influenced me more so did when I was an adult. I don't really re remember being influenced by, um, like taking on influence by classical composers when I was a young kid. So, but when I was in my mid-twenties, I really got into Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff and loved their work and um, still listen to them to this day. You know, I might put them on a playlist on Pandora or something like that. So those, those two particularly are two of my favorites for their, their harmony and, and texture and um, melody, of course. Uh, yeah, love those two guys. Great. Um, I know another um, American composer that you are uh, kind of partial to, and that's uh, the great George Gershwin. And you did a tribute show to him as well. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things, you know, obviously he's, you know, an iconic figure, but, you know, I'm interested in what particularly drew you to Gershwin as opposed to some of the other um, American composers. Well, I love the fact that Gershwin goes into the classical realm as well. And um, I play some of his classical music, some of his ragtime music, some of his jazz music. So he has a really big scope of music to offer. Um, but what I really love is that in his classical music, even in something like the Concerto in F, how much jazz harmony there is in there. It's just, it's wonderful. So one of the, one of the main things I'm attracted to in uh, music is the harmony and Gershwin, Gershwin's use of jazz harmony, you know, um, as well as like European sounds uh, and, um, and jazz rhythms and, and classical influence is the mix of it is just really amazing. And that, that's what really draws me to that. Um, and something like the Rhapsody in Blue, of how, how perfectly classical and jazzy that is at the same time. I mean, that's, that's not a great description. <laughs> but, um, no, I, Sam, what you mean? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I love, love that work. It's, it's, such a, it's a rhapsody of many different themes and, and melodies and sections in the one piece, um, which is what a, a, a rhapsody is. Uh, I, I really... I, I, I'm learning that at the moment. I play a lot of it and um, and really love it. Mm. And he has such an urban sound. You know, it's like really captures, I think, what life is in a, in a big city. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, when you work with... Um, Obviously, when you work with a singer, it's different than when you work as, you know, and, and, you know, with just instrumentalists. And how do you approach um, the art of accompaniment when you work with a singer? And what, are, what are some of the things that you try to um, be aware of? Or, um, or what, what is your thinking? How is that different than the instrumentalist when you are really a leader? Well, you've got, in the, in the case of accompanying, um, it's a good question. You've, you've got another plane going on, which is someone that is taking the melody um, and responsible for both melody, pitch, rhythm, sometimes harmony as well. But you've got this other, other level going on. Um, and for the most part, the singer is singing the melody of the song, even if it's whether it's the written melody or something they're improvising or rephrasing, but they're, they're on a, um, a melody line. Um, 
And so my job is to fill in around that. And that doesn't necessarily mean both above and below that. It might just be below that. And so what I have to be really aware of is what they're actually singing. And I mean specifically what melody notes they're singing. So I can choose to voice my chords around that how, how I need to. And that might be playing their note as well in some cases. It might be intentionally not playing their note as well and never, never playing their note. But I won't know what that note is if I don't know it. So I have to, with my ear, I have to know exactly where they are all the time so I can accompany around them. And when there's space, perhaps fill in. When, there's, when they're busy singing a lot of notes, maybe stick to something more rhythmic and sparse. And so really bounce off them and all the time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, when you are, um, have a chance to shine and take a solo and um, improvise, what, what do you think is important when you, I mean, what are your thought processes around improving and, you know, where do you, or you just, I mean, obviously I think there has to be some kind of thought process when you are improvising. Um, I'm, I'm just fascinated when, you know, what people, you know, how they approach imp improvisation. Yeah, well, when I go to take a solo, I'm thinking about creating something over a particular large space of time. And if it's one chorus of a song, that might traditionally be 32 bars. So I'm thinking of creating what is almost like a new song, like a new melody over the next 32 bars of time. So you don't have to like, be out of the gate and be playing lots of notes at the very beginning. Um, you're thinking about the arc of that solo and spacing it out. So this thing that you're about to create has a beginning, a middle, a, a peak, like an apex, and a trail off and, a, and an end. So that's, that's definitely a thought. And then I, once I'm going, I'm listening to the, I'm playing within a set of chord changes that's going on. And uh, so being aware of the chords, that are going on and the rhythms that are being made by every instrument and then fitting into the chords and the rhythm, I then compose a melody on the spot, which is my solo. And that melody is a combination of ideas that come from the melody of the song, ideas that might come from the chords that we're playing in that moment, or new little ideas or motives um, that I might have in my head that either I've used before or I think of on the spot that I come up with and join them all together um, at the same time composing. It's, it's important to note, to note that improvising is it's still composing because you're making up something on the spot. You just don't have the luxury of writing it down and looking at it for a while and then maybe erasing some of it and changing it. Once it's out there, it's done and you're on to the next measure. But it is composing and, and with that in mind, just like you would compose a melody to a song, you want to give this composition uh, an arc, a beginning, a middle, and, and an end. So that's basically my thought process in a nutshell, I, I think. All oh, right, great, thank you. No, because, you know, I, somebody told me that, you know, you should say something when you improvise. <laughs> and so I, yeah. obviously you do, you try to do, it sounds like you do. Um, what are some of the um, exciting projects that are on your horizon? I know probably some of them are on hold now because of the current situation, but um, would you like to share some of that with us? Sure. Well, one project that's always on the horizon is the Gershwin project because it, it's out there and working. Um, we've got lots of videos on YouTube of the Gershwin project. Um, but it's still something that's a work in progress as well. So I'm really hoping that before the end of the year that we can perform the Gershwin show again at a club in town, um, if not early in the new year. Um, so that's always one. Um, another project is, is I'm in the middle of creating some uh, online education. 
which is going to be for singers. And it's going to be education that helps singers work with live bands, helps them how to lead the band, um, direct the band, speak the language of the instrumentalists, and uh, all those kinds of things that singers usually only get after years of experience on the bandstand, but don't necessarily learn in singing lessons or up front. Um, and very often I find singers say to me that they would love to learn how to sort of speak muso, speak, speak musician language, um, and know what the instrumentalists are thinking and, and how they're doing what they're doing on stage. And so I'm creating some online education that serves that. That's basically the, the two projects that are going on at the moment. Oh, great. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's great. And that's something I probably would be interested in. And, uh, you know, and I think a lot of, you know, the, to me, a lot of the great singers, you know, they, they could play um, an instrument. And uh, I think a lot of singers, not every singer does play an instrument. And I think that, you know, learning how to play an instrument, you, you start learning how to, to do that. Um, what, um, when, when you choose, um, to work with musicians um, and you're forming different com combos. What do you look for in the players? Um, because there are a lot of players out there. What, 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 what makes you choose this bass player over another one, a drummer over another one? What do you, what do you look for in those uh, people that accompany you? Well, in a drummer, I look for a drummer that can play sensitive and that can play really softly. Um, and that has a really good touch on the ride cymbal uh, and the snare drum. And, um, and someone who really swings and can play right in the middle of the beat or even up on the beat as well. Um, so that's, that's definitely something I listen for in the drums. In a bass player, I'd love to hear someone who's got a real woody kind of attack on the on the strings, on the instrument, and someone who can play up on the beat, definitely on the front edge of the beat as well, so that it propels the music forward. And over overall, for both instruments, I look for someone, for people who've got a really positive energy, who bring a really positive, happy energy to the bandstand. Um, that's kind of a, a given, something that gets checked off the list first, I think. I think that's about it. Well, that's great. And I know that you, you use a, a woman basis, which, you know, good for you. Bravo for that. I think it's important that, <clears throat> you know, women enter into the jazz arena, which was, you know, uh, you know the arena of men for so many years. Um, when... I just had another question in my mind. Um, oh, you also provide some services on your website. So tell us your website and what some of those services are. And I know you, you work with singers and you work with, um, you know, you're doing the education thing, but how, how would somebody get in touch with you and, you know, what's your website and, Absolutely. So um, the website is just my name. So it's mattbaker.com.au, like the first letters of Australia. And um, the website really has everything on there. It has a contact form, which you can write to me directly if you want to. Um, it's got a merchandise store, uh, which I'm selling my DVD, my Live at Birdland DVD there, my albums, my CDs. Um, there's some merchandise there as well, like t-shirts and mugs and caps and things like that. Um, the website uh, has my calendar on there, which at the moment is pretty blank <laughs> because around the time of recording we're in lockdown because of the coronavirus. Um, uh, it has a lot of promotional information about me, like promo videos of the different bands and projects that I work with. Uh, press materials, press photographs, and things like that. I think that's about it. Um, my my bio, my EPK videos, all that, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And when is your next um, 
in-house concert? Well, I, at the moment I'm performing online, like live streaming online three times a week. And they are Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and Sundays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, the idea on the Wednesday is that it's a different themed night every week. There might be a theme of a composer or a particular singer. Um, the sun, Saturday night is like a dinner set, so it's, it's dinner music and taking requests and things like that, so you can have your dinner with some, some music in the background. Uh, and the Sunday is just a fun afternoon of jazz standards for, for either people on a, on a Sunday afternoon or for the European people at night time. Okay. And how does one get on to that? Uh, do they go to your Facebook page? Well, they go to my Facebook fan page, which is a, a different one to my personal page. So the, the URL for that is facebook.com slash Matt Baker music. And that's my, that's the page where you like the page. You don't friend request the page. You, you like it. And once you've liked that page, Matt Baker music, um, you'll then get notifications of when I go live at those times. All right, great. Um, well, I just want to ta say thank you so much for taking this time out to, you know, have this conversation. Um, is there anything else you would like to say before we uh, wrap this up? No, I don't think so. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you again. It's, I've enjoyed performing with you over the years and um, it's great we've kept that friendship up uh, over well, over now almost 10 years. I'm sure wow. I met you close to when I moved here. So it's, it's been great to, to chat with you again. Right. Well, um, everyone, uh, this is Matt Baker. Um, he's, uh, you know, a force in the jazz scene in New York. And this is his 10 year anniversary here in the States. So congratulations and many more years, Matt. Thanks. And uh, thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Okay. I want to thank Matt Baker for spending some time with us today. Here's Matt playing Foolproof. That's what my heart's become And I challenge anyone to break in Challenge anyone to make me Open up the door Cause I've been fooled before And now I'm I believe that your heart
heart is pure And cause I'm 